I wanted to show you jump zooming using the selection tool. So if you click the little arrow, that will let you click and drag over the sequence axis to zoom in on, on particular locations like this. Before I show you the second way to jump zoom, I want to show you how you can load the genomic sequence. So if you zoom in really far, you'll notice that there's this gray bar with little hyphens. This is sort of a placeholder to let you know that you haven't loaded the genomic sequence data yet. And once you do, it'll appear in this gray blur. It'll re replace the little hyphens with the DNA bases. So I'm gonna zoom out and show you how you can load the sequence for the entire chromosome. So once you do that, you can click load a sequence, the top right, and what will happen is IGBI will retrieve the genomic sequence data from our server. And now I can tell that it's loaded because now there's a gray bar underneath the sequence axis. And if I zoom in, I can see the, the sequence bases and they're color coded. Um, A's and T's are green and blue, and C's and G's are a warmer color, um, yellow and, and kind of a pink color. Also, once you've loaded the sequence, once you've zoomed in, the, zoom, zoom, the gene models start showing the, uh, the translation. So the last way to zoom is to change to the selection tool and just double click on something. So for example, I would like to see what the sequence is for this exon. So I can double click on it and now it, um, I zoom in on it and it takes up most of the screen and I can read the, the genomic sequence. So I can also double click on and select entire gene models. And the way I can do that is by th clicking the, um, the, a label or just the white space around the exons. So these boxes represent exons. And if I double click on the label or the, the lines connecting the exon boxes, I can zoom in on the gene model and it takes up most of the screen. I'd like to explain what each of these little boxes mean. So probably you've noticed that on the ends of the gene models, there are these sort of shorter, skinnier boxes. These represent the untranslated regions of the gene model. And then the taller boxes represent the, what we call CDSs or translated exons. And there, these things are individually selectable. Also, I would like to point out that when you select something, we see it, you see a red outline around it to let you know what you've selected. And everything else in the same view that has the same edges um, lights up. So this little pink bar, that's called an edge matching tool or edge matching glyph. And what it does is it signals when you're at very high zoom, when you're zoomed in really, really far, what it does is it just sort of signals, it gives you a cue that you're looking at, that, that the thing that you've selected has other things in the same view that have the same boundaries. And sometimes it can be a little distracting. And if you want, you can turn it off by going to the view menu and choosing um, the show edge matching option. So right now edge matching is checked and I'm gonna just turn it off because I, I personally find it a little distracting. So I'm gonna undo it. So now when I select on something, the edge matching lift doesn't appear. When you hover over an item in IGBI, it'll show a, uh, a tooltip to give you a little more information about it. Sometimes this can be a little distracting too. Um, so if you don't like that behavior, you can turn it off by going to the toolbar and choosing the, the tooltip icon and just clicking it. And when it gets this little uh, square uh, circle with a line through it symbol, that just tells you that the tooltips tool are off. If you want to find out information about something you've selected, you can choose the selection info tab, the bottom, and it'll give you some information about it. Uh, and you can also choose this info button up at the top right, and it will show you the same thing. 
And then if you forget how to do that, you can simply right click on the item and then choose Get Info. And while we're here, I just want to mention that pretty much everything is searchable in Igby. So if you right click a gene model, you can do a Google search, or in this case, because this is a Arabidopsis, you can search, um, you can look it up in the, the Arabidopsis information resource. Um, you can also view the genomic sequence by selecting that option. And this is a, a, a window that lets you look at a text view of the genomic sequence for the thing you've selected. You can also do a um, BLAST-P search or a BLAST-X search against the NCBI database. So there's a lot of things you can do um, with, with these right-click menus. All right, so I think I've shown you everything I needed to about how to move around in IGB. Now I'd like to show you how you can customize um, the view um, for annotation tracks. So in IGB, everything in a track, and this is called a track, is either an annotation or a graph. And ICBI lets you make a lot of changes to how things look um, so that you can, just, just to make it easier to analyze data and also make images for publication and slides. So I'm gonna show you how you can do this. Um, if, if you select a, you can select a track by clicking the track level next to it. And you can see that it's selected because there's a red outline around it. And then you choose the annotation tab and you can see a lot of different options for changing how it looks. So for example, if you don't like the color, you can change that. You can change, you can also um, modify Igby so that it, a track is always uh, stuck at a certain size. And I'll show you how, when that becomes important in a moment. And then you can also change what's called the label field. So these things are labels. And if you don't like the using an ID, you can also change it to the description. And this is particularly useful when you're exploring data. Oh. You can click, so if you're gonna make this a little bit larger. And so now you can see, it just makes it easier when you're looking at a lot of different genes to be able to read the description instead of the ID. So I think I'll leave this as it is. Uh, and now, um, and move on to the next bit where I'm going to show you how to load some data. All right. So under data access, well, first off, I think I'll zoom all the way out so that we're kind of back where we started. So this is IGB chromosome one with the sequence data already loaded. So we've configured a Arabidopsis genome with a number of different data sets that are available by default. So, I, so open up the RNA-seq uh, data folder, and I'd like to go straight to a data set called Hot Dry, and then this is the SR, SRA accession. So this is a data set from my lab. It's a few years old. Um, it's from a a heat stress and desiccation stress experiment. I'm going to open it. The first thing I'd like to do is just load some RNA-seq uh, sequence reads. So open this folder, and you, you might want to make your, your screen just a little bit bigger. And, it's list, and this folder is listing the names of a number of different data sets. There's, it's quite a large experiment. What I'd like to like you to do is go down to the bottom of the list where you'll see um, a data set called wet T2 and then PCR dupe for duplicates alignments. Just click that check mark. So the, so the first one I want you to choose is wet T2 PCR duplicate. And then I'd like you to select the one underneath it that says wet T2 data okay. And then beneath that, so there's another one, another wet T2, select dry T2 data okay. So what, I, what I'd like to do is sh show you three different RNA-seq data sets where um, one data set is 
really bad and you shouldn't use it. <laughs> um, and I just want you to see what that looks like in the browser. And then one data set that's fine. So these two, these are the two control data sets. And then one data set uh, where, um, where the data are also fine, but it's a, it's a treatment. So this is a, um, an RNA-seq sample from uh, plants that were highly dehydrated. Uh, so and undergoing a, a drought stress. Oh, okay, so um, yeah, I can make it bigger. So there's a request to make my screen much larger. Can do that. Is that better? So this is um, okay. Great. <laughs> thank, thank you, Thomas, for for bringing that up. I have a feeling that if it was not working great for you, it was probably not working great for others as well. So thank you for for mentioning that. Okay. So here are the data sets. Um, we've got. Um, hot dry SRP two two zero one five seven under RNA seq, um, and while every I kind of just want to give everybody a moment to load them, um, and while people are are doing that, I'd like to point out a, a feed. Let's see, I'm just going to make this a little bigger. Okay, so under the tabs when menu, in there are a options to take the tabs that we're looking at and move them into separate windows. So for, whoops, I hope I didn't do something, didn't do that. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> didn't mean to change it. But basically you can, if you, if you have a lot of screen real estate, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to just take these tabs and move them into a separate window. Uh, so I often do that when I'm working on a lot of different things or all at once and if I have a lot of screen real estate. I'm not going to do that right now because it's a bit um, it's a bit awkward um, it, it when giving a demo. Okay so I think everybody's got them loaded. So what I'd like to do now is take us to a particular a gene of interest and I'm going to type this in to the chat. See if I can do this. I'm going to take you to basically my favorite gene in Arabidopsis. Ah. And I'm going to type it in to type in the name. It's um, SR45A. And you can get to it by going to this top. You can go here, the search, it's kind of a quick search window, and type in SR45A. And it'll suggest it, it'll, um, if you choose, if I choose this, it'll take me there. And then there's another way to do this, where if I choose advanced search, I can uh, select for and an, look for an ID, a name, or a title, and I can just search, type in SR45A here, and it'll list everything it finds that has this name. So I can do this here, and if I hit, or I can do it here. And there's other kind of fun things you can do as well. So for example, I can do a keyword search for everything that has the word heat in the name, in the title, and then every gene that has the word heat in its description will appear in the, in the, um, in the list of results. And I can go to a particular result by double clicking. But I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I'm just going to type SR45A to take me to that particular gene. And I hit return and I jump zoomed to that gene. So it, it went by pretty fast. So if you get if you get lost, please search for SR45A and go there. All right. So I, all right, so now that I've gone to a, a gene that I'm particularly interested in looking at, I'm gonna go ahead and load the data for those three RNA seq data sets. And notice that when I selected them, in the window, in the available data window, the, um, the empty tracks appear, these gray empty tracks. And this is to let me know that the, the data sets are, are available and they're ready to, be pop, ready, to be, ready to be loaded. So to load the data, I click this button here up at the right called Load Data. And I select it. 
And what's happening now is Igby is requesting the RNA-seq data from the server um, and loading it. And I hope right off the bat, you can see there's something very different about the bottom track compared to the, 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 the middle one and the top one. And that is that most of the, well, each of these um, represents an alignment of a RNA-seq sequence. And hopefully what you can see is that all of the ones in the bottom track are very similar. They have, um, essentially they're, they're all in the same location. And that's because when we made this library, we over amplified it um, during a certain stage of the library preparation. And so as a result, we ended up with lots and lots of sequences that were essentially the same. And so if we hadn't bothered to look at the data in this, this browser, we probably wouldn't have noticed that there was any kind of a problem. And so this illustrates why it's a really good idea to look at your RNA-seq data or your TIP-seq data, et cetera, in a, some kind of a tool like this. Um, so I'm going to show you something else you can do with um, uh, Igby, and that is with the selection tool. You can select more than one thing, more than one thing at a time. So I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to click. What you do is you you click the white space, and then you drag over a region that contains things you want to that you want to select. And so when I let go. Notice that everything that I click dragged over now has a red outline. And then up at the top right in the selection info box, I, it's telling me how many things I selected. So it says I selected 38 items. Um, now notice that there don't really appear to be 38 items here. There's actually one, two, three, four, I don't know, there's about 10. And that's because ICBI is not showing you all of the data. I'm going to zoom into this location and show you exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm going to click drag over the coordinates and boom, now that, that stack of reads that I showed you is in the middle of the screen. And I just selected them again by click dragging. And notice again, it says 38 selections. What's happening is each individual track has invisible rows where it can lay things, lay things out across the horizontal axis. So in this case, there's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is that nine? Yeah, I think nine rows where it can place things. And then there's a top row where it draws everything else that couldn't fit into the bottom, bottom nine rows. And this is kind of a subtle idea that, that takes a little getting used to, but once you get the hang of it, it's, it's not that difficult to work with. The number of rows that you're allowed to, that Igby, will allow, that Igby is allowed to draw into is called the stack height. And we can change that um, by right-clicking a track and choosing the option, set a stack height. So I'm gonna do that right now for this track. And when I do that, it opens a window and it says, enter new maximum stack height, zero for unlimited. And the button here says optimal 38. And what this is doing is it's telling me that there are up to um, 38 of items all stacked up vertically, or that could be all stacked up vertically in the track that I've selected in this particular view. So let's just choose um, 38. And notice how now this track has expanded vertically and the top uh, dark bar is gone now. And that's because now we're seeing everything that was in this particular view. And I've selected them and now there's 38. And so this is a very important idea because oftentimes you'll be working with a, a region that has thousands and thousands of of sequences that you, that you want to look at. Now, if I were to do the same thing here with this track, probably it would overwhelm the display. So let's move back over here to this gene. Whoops. So this is, an, um, this is a gene that's upregulated under um, stress. So I expect that this region will have many thousands of reads. 
So to, to try that out, um, I'm going to click and drag the track, the edges of the track labels. So notice that when I do this, so I've clicked, dragged, clicking and dragging the edges of the track labels. Notice that when I do this, the track label expands. And when I release the mouse, the uh, stack height within the track increases. So here's, here's another example. So I'm going to click and drag the top track. And boom, I now have more rows or a higher stack height in this, um, in this track. Now, because I'm sort of focused in on this one gene, SR45A, it doesn't really make sense to reserve so much white space for the plus strand, since this is a minus strand gene. So there's a way to compress these two tracks by selecting, basically what I'd like to do is combine the plus strand and the minus strand features for this, uh, for the annotations into one track. And I can do this under the data access panel by clicking the plus slash minus um, checkbox. And this is just a shorthand to let me know that if I choose that option, then the plus and minus strand or forward and reverse strand um, items will be combined into one track. And also notice that we have, it looks like more space than we really need here about where my mouse is. So basically this track is, has a stack height that's maybe a little bit larger than what it needs to be given what, what we're looking at. So I'd like to change this. So to change it, I can click the track label to select it and right click it and choose um, set stack height. And it gives me the same window as before and I'll click optimal. And notice how the items in the track are now have now sort of expanded to take up all of the vertical space. And there's actually a shortcut that lets you do that. You can click a track and up at the on the toolbar, there's a button that looks like this that has a red outline around it to signal that when you click this, it's going to only affect whichever track you've selected. And if you just choose that, basically it does the same thing. Uh, there's one more thing before I really start looking at diving in to look at this RNA seq data in more detail. I want to make sure that the gene model track is not going to get uh, changed in size when I start doing things with these uh, RNA seq tracks. So I'm going to select the, the gene models track and I'm going to go back to the annotation tab and I'm going to choose the option lock track height in pixels. So I apologize for the sort of jargony term. Pixels just is a, a term for um, basically a, a size measurement that's connected to your computer screen. So I'm going to choose lock track height. And I think I would like this to be a little bigger. So I'm going to change this to uh, 250 for 250 pixels. And when I click go, what's going to happen is this airport track is going to get taller and it's gonna take up more space on the screen, more pixel real estate. Choose go, and there it is, it's bigger. And now, no matter what I do, this track will stay the same. So we've kind of gotten to the point where we don't need this bottom tray anymore, so I'm going to retract it and hide it so that we can have more screen real estate. And then I'm gonna do the same thing to the tray over on the right side and click it. And first off, we've kind of established that this track is not very useful because of these PCR duplicates. So let's just delete it. Let's get rid of it. So I'm gonna right click it and just choose delete track. We don't need it anymore. And click yes. And also for comparison, because we're, oh, so I'd like you to, um, I'd like you to also, well, this is a, a pretty complex display. And what I'd like to do is use these RNA-seq um, 
data to investigate what's happening here in this gene model. So notice we have um, what look like a lot of alternative splicing happening in the central region. And in particular, there is a one gene model that has a translation that goes from this position all the way through to this position. So it encodes a, a, a protein, basically the full length protein for this gene. But notice that um, there are other gene, there are other splice variants that have different, um, different patterns of splicing. So for example, um, there is one splice variant here that has an exon in the middle of this big intron. And when this exon is included in the gene model, it introduces a stop codon here. So you can see how this exon is a bit tall and then transitions over to a skinny, um, skinnier exon, letting us know that there is a stop codon here. So in this particular case, this gene has a very interesting splicing pattern that when this exon is spliced in, it interrupts the translation and ultimately produces a truncated protein. And when it's left out, the translation is not interrupted and, we, and it produces a full length protein. So what I'd like to do is find out if there's any change or, or what the overall prevalence is for these um, splice variants. So to do that, I'm going to show you how you can apply um, filters to a data set. And since we're getting close to three o'clock, I think I will do that and then um, end it there. Um, so to start with, uh, right click one of the tracks. I'm going to start with the, um, the control wet T2. I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose the option of filter. And what this will do is, based on how, what I do next, it's going to hide some of the data that is distracting and that I don't really need to work with. So I'm going to choose filter. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a filter that will only uh, show splice uh, sequence reads that map to one location in the genome. So sometimes um, spliced aligners um, can't dis it, they can't really do a very good job of um, identifying the best, most accurate alignment for a sequence. So oftentimes they will include multiple options that are, as far as it's concerned, equal in quality. Um, and often you don't really want to work with that data. So we have a filter that allows you to select and, and display only those sequences that have a unique mapping to the genome. So I choose that. Um, and it looks like all of these are already uniquely mapped, nothing disappeared. Now we'll do a second filter, but we'll show only reads with gaps. That is only um, sequences that support, or, or that um, contain support for an intron. Um, and you'll see what that looks like in a moment. I choose that, click OK, and then click OK, and then it takes effect. So notice now that um, a lot of the data that we were looking at now before just basically vanished because we're filtering it out. We're not looking at it anymore. And the way that you can tell that a track has been filtered in this way is that you'll see on the track uh, label a little filter symbol. Okay. So now we're only seeing the reads that are going to be relevant to this uh, splicing event. Right? Now, we're not seeing all of them because, um, because of the stack height is set to something very small. So let's change it. We can click drag these, uh, the, this track label to show more data. And I don't really know how much data is here. So I'm actually just going to select the track and show everything by clicking the track to select it and then clicking on this icon that will show me everything. If I do that, um, now I'm seeing all of the sequence reads. So at this point, I can see that there are quite a no large number of sequence reads that support the exon skipping of the, the exon um, retention event. But it looks like there are one, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven that support the skipping event. So it seems like there might be maybe mostly um, sequences supporting inclusion of the exon. And we can count them by count uh, reads, specific reads by clicking on them. And if you select, if you click a read or click something and then hold down the shift key, you can select multiple items. So if I do that, I've basically just counted them. There are eight, uh, there are eight RNA-seq reads that supported removal of the intron, complete removal of the intron, and therefore support expression of the, yes, thank you, Noelin, <laughs> that support um, expression of the splice variant that encodes the full-length protein. All right, so that's, we've kind of looked at this. Um, if, if we were doing a, an analysis, we probably would, you know, write that number down or put it into a spreadsheet. I'm going to um, hide this, compress this track. Um, there's notice at the top left of each area, each track, there's a little rectangle with a minus symbol in it. And if you click this minus symbol like that, what happens is you, you basically just compress all of the data into a single track. And this is actually kind of a neat um, feature. It gets stuff out of the way without your having to delete it. And it also makes it easier to count. So if I, so I'm gonna show you, show you how that works. Again, using the, the selection tool, click and drag over everything in that track. And since it's all, compressed into one row, it's easy to do. If I select it, I've basically just selected everything um, for that gene in this track. And notice it tells me there's 239 selections. So there were 239 sequences that were came from this gene in the experiment. Okay, so now let's look at splicing and in the other data set, the, the treatment. I'm going to click it and choose the um, ex maximize uh, stack height button and the toolbar, click it. And notice now that we're seeing all of the reads for this track and we can select, we can select them all and count them. And it looks like there are about 4,000 of them. So there's about 4,000 sequences from this sample and they were, I just happen to know this, but the samples were sequenced to about the same depth. And so this is just reflective of the fact that this gene is highly induced by, by drought stress, by a desiccation stress. So now I, I need to see more detail and I don't really wanna look at all 4,000 reads. So I'll apply the filter again to this track. So I'm right click on the track label and choose filter like that. And I'll add a, another filter. I'll add the um, single mapper filter. Okay. I'll add another filter so that I'm only going to view reads with gaps that are um, relevant to the splicing. Choose that. Click OK. Click OK. And now I've, I've got rid of a lot of the data that I didn't really need to look at. Now I'll stretch everything in the vertical dimension so I can actually see things. And look at how splicing is, let's look what's happening with respect to splicing with this data set. So here again is our intron, our, our interesting region of splicing. I think I'll just zoom in just on this area so that it's easier to inspect. And so now it looks like, unlike the other sample, the vast majority of sequence reads are coming from the form where this intron was completely spliced out. So yeah, so this is pretty much visual evidence that under a stress, um, the full length form is very highly expressed um, relative to the other forms that don't encode a full length protein. And I think I'm going to, oh, one last thing. Um, 
you can take pictures by clicking this uh, picture icon, this camera icon, and you can make images of what you see and then save them, show them in slides, um, um, use them in figures. Um, and I think that's probably where we should end because uh, there is a seminar coming up, I think at three, maybe 3.30. So if anyone would like to ask uh, questions, um, feel free, I'll stay on the line for a bit longer, um, but uh, probably we can finish up. I think you have a, a an event at three o'clock or is it 3.30? Oh, four o'clock. Okay. <laughs> so Nick just said it was at four o'clock. Um, well, I think, all right. Well, I guess if it's at four, I could keep going. So I've shown you RNA-seq data. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, so Nick says um, seminar is at four, but it's okay to finish at 3 p.m. too. Um, let's see. I wonder who else is still on. I think I, ha I, I have something else I could show you about ChIP-seq data. So I think you've kind of seen most of what I had to say about RNA-seq. Um, mind you, this is a, a pretty simple data set. These are um, not paired end reads. And also the, the data are essentially from the same genotype as the reference sequence. So we're not seeing a lot of interesting variations. Um, notice that in a lot of the read alignments, there are these little colored bits. Those are letting me know or letting us know that in these positions, there was a disagreement between the genomic sequence and the, uh, and the, the RNA-seq sequence. Um, if this were a different cultivar of Arabidopsis, if these data came from a different cultivar, I'd probably see lots of places where there were um, pretty much a uniform blue or orange color all the way up and down, showing me, indicating a, a polymorphism in the sequenced variety compared to the, the reference. Okay, let's see. So now I, I'm gonna go ahead and, and look at a different data set, a ChIP-seq data set. So, if, so we don't really need these RNA-seq data sets anymore, so I'm gonna go ahead and delete them. Yes. And things are going to look a little wonky because I've set the, the stat, I've sort of permanently fixed the, um, the gene model height to 250 um, pixels. So it's going to look a little bit weird as I set up for the next um, display. Okay. Oh, so notice how um, my, my screen is actually a lot bigger than 250 pixels. So, um, so, my, uh, so I've got a lot of empty space and I'm gonna fill it up with some data now. So just, just to let you know, um, the RNA-seq data for Arabidopsis are fairly extensive. There's this uh, heat stress data set, a heat stress and desiccation stress data set uh, from my lab. Um, and you can use these SRA accessions to find out more information about them. Um, also, there's a, a little I button next to most things. And if you click that, it'll open up a web page. Um, so here's the web page. This one opens with more information about the data set. Okay. Also, um, there is a data set that's been set up by the Provart Lab that is quite extensive. So it has RNA-seq data that were used to generate the Aeroport 11 annotations. And as you can see, there's lots of them, just massive numbers, all different kinds of tissues. Um, and then there's also the developmental transcriptome from Klepikova et al. Um, and these data are also, all, also these data are shown on the, um, the BAR website. And as you can see, there's a lot of different types of things. So um, in, with respect to this gene, SR45A, uh, I know that it has a very interesting splicing pattern that seems to change depending on the condition or the sample type. So um, I haven't done this yet, but probably I will be looking through each of these data sets to compare the splicing pattern um, that I observe in these other data sets with the heat stress and desiccation stress data sets, because I'm curious to understand what might be regulating the splicing pattern and why it might be different in different sample types. That's an example of what you can do um, using 
a nice uh, collection of data like the one that Nick's lab has provided and that we're providing here with this somewhat more limited data sets. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a ChIP-seq data set. So most people, um, a lot of people who use IGBI use it to analyze ChIP-seq data. And so I'm not going to go too much into too much detail to explain what this is, but just suffice it to say that um, you're going to see locations or visualizations for locations where transcription factors bind. So I'm going to focus on um, ANT, ANT, I'm just going to call it ANT for short. This is a transcription factor in Arabidopsis that, um, by, that regulates um, aspects of floral development very early on um, in floral development. And this is a data set that's about to be published um, and uh, it's now publicly available. And I'm going to show you um, now a different type of uh, data for IGBI called a genome graph. So go ahead, if you're still with me, <laughs> go ahead and open up um, the graphs folder and choose um, S67 no tag um, chip scaled coverage. This is a control experiment. This is a chip seek experiment using um, a, um, a antibody against a, a tag, um, an epitope tag that was basically not present in this um, sample type. Sorry, I'm not really explaining that very well, but just go ahead and select it and then do the same thing for the one underneath it, S67 and Venus. So this is the actual chipped data set. So this is the this is the data set that's going to reveal locations in the genome where the AND transcription factor binds. So we're going to try something kind of ambitious. I'm going to zoom all the way out on chromosome one, and I'm going to load all of the data for these two tracks. And hopefully it will not kill my browser. Um, but I, I encourage you, if you have a lot of computer memory, to, to give this a try. Um, and it's going to take a few moments to load. Because basically what's happening is um, all of the data for chromosome one are streaming over the internet from, um, uh, from an Amazon S3 bucket um, into the browser. Um, oh, and I have a, it looks like I have a question from, um, from, from Nick. He asks, uh, can you comment on how many RNA-seq data sets are available for other species under available data? That's a great question. Um, we have a kind of like a developmental transcriptome sort of thing for human. So the human, for the human genome, we've set up, um, I think there's about 24 different samples for many different tissues. Uh, for tomato, we have, um, a, a number of data sets, but basically it's just data. Oh, and I think we have one for corn and then another one for sorghum. Um, but unfortunately, we have not set up an awful lot of RNA seq data sets. I mean, we haven't nearly scratched the surface of, of what's available. Um, and we'd love to offer more. Um, so, but I think for Arabidopsis, thanks to your work and well, mainly thanks to your work and also airport, um, we've got massive numbers of RNA-seq data sets that make this a really powerful um, resource. Right, so it looks like our data have loaded. So now what you're seeing are a different kind of annotation. Ah, so Mark Johnson asks, can the work of adding more data sets be distributed in the community? Yeah, that would, I, there is definitely possible to do that. Um, it's just a matter of, I guess, getting people organized and together to do that. That would be really, really great. Because um, the actual sort of infrastructure needed to do that is quite easy to set up. Um, and yeah, oh, yeah, good question. All right, great discussion. So please get, keep going with that. Um, I wanted to show you these two ChIP-seq data sets. So now what we're seeing is essentially um, locations where uh, chip, chip seek reads aligned onto the genome. And we are looking at two graphs. So I'm going to show you the how to notice that the there's sort of this y-axis here. It goes from zero to 
about probably 200 for the no tag, um, the control. And then it goes from about zero to maybe 130 for the, the chipped sample. So these two graphs are kind of hard to compare because they're on different scales. So ICBI lets you, um, when you load a graph, you can choose this graph uh, button and choose a select all to select them both. And then you can put them on the same scale. So there's this little segment called Y axis scale, and you can choose, um, you know, the minimum value is zero. For this one, I think I'm gonna set it the maximum to maybe um, 200. That seems like a good number. Hit return. And now they're on the same scale and they're more comparable. So one of the first things you probably would notice when you look at this for the first time is that there's a region in the middle that has uh, basically the same pattern in both data sets. So let's zoom in and take a look at that. There's something here that's basically attracting a lot of, of chip seek reads. And here it is. This is very mysterious. I don't know what this is, but it is annotated as an unknown function. And for some reason, it has accumulated what look like thousands maybe of uh, sequence reads, chip sequence reads in both the chipped sample and the, the control. So the control didn't have the antibody that was used to pull down the transcription factor. And yet there's still loads and loads of, of reads in this location right on top of this gene, which is annotated as an unknown protein. So who knows what this thing really is? Um, and I don't know what that is. Um, I've always been kind of mildly curious about it. But this kind of just illustrates the importance of having some kind of control for your ChIP-seq data. Because as you can see, there's a lot of places where we have basically the same pattern um, everywhere. So, so even here as well, I mean, there's nothing, no genes here, but there are clearly uh, places where there are lots of sequences that aligned. And so the way, the way this, you have to interpret this, this graph in the case of ChIP-seq data is the x-axis, sorry, the y-axis position represents the number of sequence reads that aligned to the position indicated on the x-axis. I hope that was clear. All right, so let's zoom out a bit. Let's see if we can find a place where there is a lot of sequence in the treatment sample, the chip sample, and not so much in the, oh, there's one, in the control. So here's obviously a place where there's some, uh, where the transcription factor bound in, ah, okay. So here we have this homeo domain like superfamily protein. So it looks like the ant transcription factor bound here, and maybe there's a little bit of binding around it. So I wonder if this is maybe regulated by the ant transcription factor. We could find out more about it. Um, and, but it, because we've, you know, analyze this data a lot, I'd like to move to a particular gene that um, my collaborator, Beth Krizek, um, did a lot of work on um, with this data set. So it's AN3. Uh, so choose, so you may see it, GIF, GIF1, has various different synonyms. We we'll just go there. And let's load the data in this region. Also, let's load the sequence. And it looks like um, we have some binding in this region. And it looks like the, there's two peaks, two areas of binding where the transcription factor has a site where it can bind, overlapping the first exon and then also overlapping this other exon. So it's kind of an interesting gene. We have two annotated transcription start sites for some reason. So let's change the graph scale so that we're using up more of this white space. So you select all, and let's change the maximum to, let's say, how about 50? Let's see how that looks. Oh, that looks pretty good. So, and by pretty good, I mean, we're seeing all of the shape. So we're seeing the top of the, 
this mound of, of, of uh, reads, and then the next one as well. Okay, so for this particular experiment, um, uh, Beth did both the ChIP-seq, but she also um, did an RNA-seq experiment as well. So she um, analyzed uh, the expression pattern of um, in the same, she did an RNA-seq experiment using essentially the same tissue type as for the ChIP-seq. So let's take a look at that. Um, so we're gonna use, um, let's see, not sure if I wanna do, yeah, let's look at the RNA-seq reads. One moment, just wanna check something. Ah, okay, what I'm trying to do is make this image. <laughs> okay, um, let's stick with the graphs. And instead of aligning, looking at the sequence reads, we'll look at graphs instead. So we're going to use these scaled graphs and that uh, allow us to compare different RNA-seq libraries. So they've been uh, scaled so that um, we've taken into account different um, levels of, of sequencing depth. So these samples come from a, a strain that she constructed that uh, placed uh, the ant transcription factor under the control of an inducible promoter. So I'm gonna go ahead and load the first uh, two samples. This is the, uh, a sample where the ant transcription factor was induced um, and then another where it wasn't. And so I have a, I have a question um, asking me to explain genome graphs. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. I, I didn't really go explain that very clearly. Uh, so um, let me explain it now. So to explain it, I think what I'll do is I'll kind of zoom in on these two mounds. So I'm positioning these two um, hills next to the, the y-axis. And I'm gonna zoom in right in that location right here. So what you're seeing here is by, by genome graph, what I'm talking about is um, essentially a kind of data structure that has um, uh, basically an X, an X uh, position, which represents the, uh, the a position along the genome, base pair position. I'll zoom in even more so you can actually see the bases. And then it has a Y value that represents something. It could be anything. In this case, it represents the number of chip seek or um, uh, control uh, sequence reads that aligned to a particular position. So in this case, um, in this data set, there were almost two <laughs> reads that aligned to this T position. And it's, it's a little tricky to say that because this is a scaled graph. So what it actually represents is the number of reads that aligned here in this sample divided by the, uh, the total number of reads that aligned in the entire sample times a million. <laughs> so, or something like that. Um, I'm not, kind of embarrassed, I'm not really sure. But basically, it doesn't quite matter what what it is, um, you have to just, the, the, the point of it is to compare um, the, the y values in each graph to each other graph. So hopefully that made sense. And it's just a, it's just a very easy, simple way to visualize um, patterns in the data. So in this case, this ChIP-seq uh, sample, this, this hill tells me there were a lot of, uh, that, that the ant transcription factor was able to bind to this region um, with high affinity, higher affinity than to other places. Okay. All right. So let me just, I think I'll zoom back out to look at the entire gene again. Zoom in a bit. All right. So now I'm going to load genome graphs for um, the RNA-seq data. So the next graphs that load are going to be uh, representing the number of RNA-seq reads that aligned uh, to this region. And look, look at how the pattern is a bit different. So here we have a kind of choppy looking pattern 
on this final exon, and then there's quite a lot of variability, and then there's nothing over on top of the intronic region, and then there's a bit more, and then there's nothing, and there's a bit more. This is a very standard kind of pattern that you'll see with RNA-seq um, graphs uh, because it, it, the pattern perfectly matches, or mostly perfectly matches, the, the exons. Because only the um, RNA that was converted to cDNA will uh, be sequenced. And this is kind of interesting because you can sort of see that um, you know this gene model has kind of a comp this gene has kind of a complex pattern. Um, it looks like it can start transcription in this location and in this other location further downstream of it. And this is a minus strand gene model, so transcription goes from right to left. And it, so it kind of looks like there might be some very low level of transcription um, of this part of the gene, as you can see from here, but it's kind of hard to tell. And also, um, this we expect that if this gene is induced by ant, then there would be more expression in the induced sample than in the uninduced sample. And here, this is very subtle, but if you look at the scale, it does, it may be that there is more expression in the induced sample. So here's where the scaling uh, feature becomes really important. So let's put the, um, the, 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 the induced and the, and the control on the same scale. So we'll do that by clicking both of the track labels. We go back to the graph um, tab, and they're both selected here. And so let's put them on the same scale. So let's give them the same maximum value. And it looks like probably 20 might be a good number, um, just so that we can see enough of the detail. When we do that, it does kind of look like maybe there's more in the induced, but it's really, really subtle. I mean, it, it's not a very big effect. So I'm gonna show you another thing you can do in this kind of situation that's really helpful. And that's where you can actually combine um, graphs. So the way that you do that is you select, you multi-select them. So I'm gonna, I want the, um, the, the green one to be on top. So I select it first. You'll see what I mean in about a bit. Select that first, and then I select the pink one, the um, treatment sample. And then I go to back to the graph tab, and then I choose join. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna put both of these graphs into the same track. And notice how it changes the name to joined graphs. And next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna collapse them by using the collapse icon. So I click that, and now what's happened is the pink graph is drawn in the background, and then the green graph is drawn in the back in the foreground. So now it's a lot easier to tell that the pink graph was generally taller and had more data, not very much, but, more, but it did have more data than the green graph. So the green is the control and the pink is the treatment. And that's very subtle. I mean, if you were to look at this data in um, just the raw numbers, the, the pink graph would be a little bit higher than the green graph. Um, but it's very, it's a very small effect um, and very, very subtle. And this particular data set is interesting because she did actually, she did a time course. So she did a, an induction of the transcription factor for two hours, collected some samples, and then she let it go for another four hours, for a total of four hours, collected samples, and then eight hours. Um, and I'm not going to do this same exercise with those other data sets, um, but I, we'll show you a picture of what that looks like. Let's see, here it is. So here is an image that I made um, showing what those four sample types look like. So this is two hours, four hours, and eight hours. It almost looks like at eight hours, there's even more induction, but it's, it's really hard to tell. So this is basically how you can uh, visualize um, chip seq data together with RNA seq data to understand um, expression and how it's controlled. All right, and that is really it. <laughs> That's all I've got. <laughs>
So thank you all very, very much for attending. I hope that was useful. Also feel free to unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question using your voice instead of typing. And I missed something very basic. This is Allison DeLong. Hi. Um, hi, thanks so much. This was really helpful, but I, I missed a couple of steps going back and forth between um, screens. And so how did you get to AN3? Oh, I, um, I, I, I searched for it. So can you see in the top left? Or just barely, left yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, it's hard to see. Um, well, basically I just deleted the stuff that's there and then I typed in A and three. Okay. And then, um, and then there's a lot of things that have those three letters in them. So, okay. uh, so then I just chose the, the bottom one because I, you know, I knew what I was looking for. Um, so it's, I selected the thing that says GIF, GIF1, ATGIF1, A and 3. This particular gene has a lot of different um, synonyms. So I'll choose that. And, um, and you have to do that before you hit load data, correct? It's, it's usually a good idea because if you, if you click load data and you're really far zoomed out like this, you'll just, you, you might slow things down a bit. So for example, I'm, let's say I'm zoomed out or I'm zoomed in a different location. If I click, click load data, what's gonna happen is it's gonna load all the data for where I am. Okay, so the window okay. actually sets the data, the amount of data that you load. Yes, exactly. Thank you for asking that question <laughs> because I don't think I said that. <laughs> so it's really good that you asked that. Yeah, so you only load the data, if you click this load data button, it only loads data for where you're at right then. Um, and it, it kind of does that because it can really slow things down. If you've got a really big data set, for example, if you've got an RNA-seq data set that has, you know, 5 million reads, that would be really a lot of data to load at once. And um, so it can be very tricky. And Great, thank you. Okay. Ah, so you can see it's, it's taken a while. Oh, there's a lot of stuff here. Great. Uh, hi, Anne. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, great talk. Uh, do you want to show me how to load the data, like the chipsick data? I sure. Yeah, confirm. Sure. Okay, I'm going to go back to AN3. So I kind of lost track of where I was at. Um, here we go. Ah, right. So, um, so, so to to load the data. Um, you, you can either, if you, if you happen to have a file that you've made yourself, mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can open it um, by, there's a, a little folder icon at the top where you can click that and it will let you choose a file um, or you can choose file, open file. Um, there's another option, open URL. Um, won't, uh, I can show you that if you like. But, um, but to load data that we've set up for you to work with in advance, you would uh, go to the data access tab and then, um, and then just look in the available data part. It's this square um, at the lower left. And at least for Arabidopsis, we've set up, um, we've set up an RNA-seq folder uh, that has a lot of those RNA-seq data sets. And what you do is you just open the folders and, and you know, look for the thing that you're looking for. I mean, you have to kind of know that it's there. Um, and then once you've opened up, opened it up far enough, then you'll see names of things, names of data sets, and then little check, a little checkbox next to things. And if you click the checkbox, then Igby will then um, open it, create a new track mm -hmm. for the data set. Um, and then to actually get the data to load, uh, to fill up the empty track, and you can tell that it's empty because it's gray, you have to click this load data button. 
And what will happen then is the data will be retrieved from a server somewhere and added to IGBY. And, um, and then if you go to a different location, notice how I'm zooming out a bit. Now I'm seeing more gray space. Yeah. That's because I, I, there's nothing there yet. So I have to click load data and it'll load more. And then you can just kind of move around. And then if you lose track of where you are, you can, it actually kind of works out really well because you, you'll, you, you can kind of see from the gray space and the white space where you've been. Um, and so if you kind of lose track of where you are, you can easily find where you were, you had been working by um, looking for <laughs> kind of these breaks in the gray. And then you can just click and drag over the sequence axis again to go back to where you were. So it's, it's hard to get lost. Okay, but I don't really need this data set anymore, so I'm going to delete it. Um, as I, I'm, my my IGB is getting a bit slow, I think, because I've got a lot of data, of data. And so to get rid of stuff, you just right click on it and then choose delete track and, and then it's gone. <laughs> So I, cl I clicked the uh, load data and I found the loaded um, sequences instead of the track. Can you show me how oh. to show the Oh, track? sure. Sure, yeah. So um, let's see. So let's, I'll open up the, the ChipSeq again. And um, there's, in the folder, there's sort of two, in most of these, there's usually two subfolders. In this case, um, in, the, in Beth's data, there's two folders, uh, reads, and graphs, oh. and so, so so yeah. So the reads are. I think that's probably what you selected. Yeah, um, you yeah. probably took. Yeah, because sometimes you don't really need to look at the reads, and sometimes you do. <laughs> it just depends on what you're trying to do. Um, so for ChipSeq data, I think most of the time, people are most interested in the graphs. Um, but it's worth looking at the reads because. You you want to you don't really know what you're going to find until you look at it, and you might notice a problem, or something unexpected. So it's always a good idea, in my view, to just look at your data in as many different ways um, as you can, so, because you might notice something that's important. All right. Okay. Thank you so much.